Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to Wes Moore, a best-selling author, social entrepreneur, military veteran, and the CEO of Robinhood, one of the largest organizations fighting poverty in the country. His most recent book tells the story of what happened in Baltimore after the death of Freddie Gray five years ago. We talk about the lessons from that experience that resonate with meaning today. Let's listen. It's an honor to have you, Wes, join me on the podcast today. I reached out to you because of your great new book, Five Days, The Fury Reckoning of an American City, which you wrote with this terrific journalist, Erica Green. It's been five years after the unrest and uprising in Baltimore that followed the death of Freddie Gray. I'd like to start by asking why you wrote this book. Yeah, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be on you, and, and thanks so much, Josh. And, you know, I, I wrote the book because there are many feelings and emotions that I was still very much wrestling with. Uh, you know, feelings of, of, of heartache and disappointment, feelings of, of anger, feelings of complicity to what happened. Um, you know, I, I remember I was at Freddie Gray's funeral and, um, and I remember just looking around the funeral and thinking to myself, and that was the first funeral I've ever attended of somebody who I didn't know them while they were living. And I remember just thinking and sitting there and looking around and wondering, was I nor anyone else in that chapel willing to do what it would take to make sure that this doesn't have to happen again? And, and so the reason I really wanted to dig into this was both to understand what was happening and also look at it through the eyes of these eight people, but then also in my own mind, to be able to really dig into not just the tragedy of his death, but also the tragedy of his life. Um, because I felt like that story oftentimes wasn't told. That story where people where oftentimes when we're talking about Freddie Gray, it's always about the interaction with police. It's about the week he was in a coma. It's about the, the, uh, the unrest and the uprising that took place the night of his funeral. It's about what happened in Baltimore around that time. But we skim over the 25 years prior that he lived on this planet. And we can't because I feel like it is so relevant to actually understanding how he was, where he was, that final interaction that he had with law enforcement. And then in many ways, it wasn't just that the police system and the policing system failed him. It was actually that the policing system was the last system to fail Freddie Gray. And that's the thing I really wanted to also dig into and explore. So talk about some of the other systems and the, the, environment that you are writing about in this book that led to this catastrophe in Baltimore? Freddie Gray was born premature and underweight. Uh, His mother battled addiction for much of her life. His mother lived in deep poverty her entire life. Uh, Freddie's mother never attended high school and she could not read or write. And so when Freddie was born, uh, his mother, who was still battling the, uh, you know, battling a heroin addiction, uh, he was born exposed to heroin, him and his twin sister when they were born. So they were, uh, they were born not just underweight, but already battling the fact that they had been exposed to this toxin. Once they were finally, once they finally gained enough weight to leave the hospital, they moved into a housing project in North Cary Street, which is over in West Baltimore. Uh, that housing project, that along with 480 other homes were actually cited in a civil lawsuit in 2009 because of the endemic levels of lead that existed inside of that home. Uh, you know, I, I actually found out through the research of this book that the CDC indicates that, uh, that any exposure to lead is damaging. But if a person has upwards of six micrograms per deciliter of lead in their blood, that that person will have cognitive damage for the remainder of their life. Freddie Gray had 36. And so this was a young man who was born premature, underweight, 
born in deep poverty, exposed to heroin, and also lead poisoned. And by this time in his life, he was two years old. So what does that tell you about how people think about these problems that are captured in a snippet of video? It's, it's one of these things where I think people act like poverty is a choice. Like people wake up in the morning, it's like, yeah, man, I, I love poverty. I love existing where every single, where, where from the moment I wake up to the moment I go down at night, I'm reminded that I live in poverty. I'm reminded by the water I'm drinking and the air that I'm breathing and the homes that I'm living in and the communities that I exist in and the way that I'm policed. You know, I'm reminded of how great poverty is. Like, like people would just up and pick up. And, and my argument when I hear people say that poverty is a choice, my argument back to them is it is a choice. But it's not a choice of the individuals who are inflicted and feel the weight of poverty every day. It's the choice of our society who, who, who we've created a devil's bargain as to how much pain we're willing to tolerate and see in our neighbors as long as it doesn't, in, as long as it doesn't impact us. So when we're watching those final moments for Freddie, when we're watching those final moments, it's important to understand that we can condemn the police department or the officers, but the reality is, is that that was the last system that failed Freddie, not the first. Baltimore was a big focus when the events of five years ago happened. And a lot of people ask what's wrong with Baltimore. In the years since, particularly this year, people have recognized that it's not just Baltimore. How do you think your perspective on Baltimore can inform the larger discussion about race, poverty, and cities in this country? I think one of the things that have been the real takeaways for me is that not only is it just Baltimore, it's not just policing. And, and this is the thing that I think oftentimes when we're having conversations and we look at, the, at these, this, this horribly and horrifically long list of names that also continues to grow of Black people who are having these interactions with police and losing their lives in these interactions with police, that oftentimes that, you know, that the conversation comes down to policing and the need for policing reform, the need for policing accountability, all real, all important. Because, you know, we have to remember, even in Baltimore alone, that for the, if you look at the two years before Freddie Gray, again, this is just Baltimore, there was Anthony Anderson and Chris Brown and Tyrone West. And so you see how this, 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 this ec- epidemic conti- you know, continued. But the thing that I think is also really important, and I think this highlights, and we continue to see how it gets highlighted in our society going forward, is that it also is not just about the challenges of policing. That policing really becomes one rung. Um, but if we're not also addressing the levels of housing discrimination that we have, if we're not also addressing education, if we're not addressing health, if we're not addressing transportation, if we're not really thinking critically about how all these elements play into it, then we are missing a bigger point. And that's one of the reasons why I think that the Baltimore situation ended up becoming so different than even some of the others. For example, like what we saw, whether it was Walter Scott in Charleston or whether it was Eric Gardner in New York, the reason that those incidents took on a different flavor, and I would argue that the Baltimore one took on a greater flavor, was it, had a greater correlation to a place like Ferguson with Michael Brown. Right. It wasn't just because the situations of the interaction with the police were different. I would argue that when you look at the dynamics and the structural dynamics of Ferguson, they much closer mirror the structural dynamics of a Baltimore when you're looking at the hyper-segregation, when you're looking mm-hmm. at the economic disparities than what you saw, for example, in Staten Island in the case of Eric Gard. So how does that transition happen from seeing this as a narrow question of policing to see it as a question of policing plus, policing plus these environmental uh, you know, issues, um, structural issues in these different systems that um, have created a lot of misery yeah. for people? I think when we're talking about this idea of, of when we're saying do lives matter, it really does mean every aspect of the life cycle. It means, are, are we talking about, are we doing everything that we can do to make sure that children are being born into this world, uh, you know, supported and being born into this world healthy? 
are we making sure that the first school environments that and the first educational environments that we're understanding that that's not necessarily when that child walks into a classroom, but that they are receiving educational supports and educational frameworks long before they ever meet their first formal teacher. And we're making sure that the school buildings that we have are places that actually encourage levels of educational, not just attainment, but educational curiosity, that the buildings actually match the hopes and the expectations of the, of the dreams that we're hoping that our students have. Do we have job training programs that are preparing people for work in the 21st century? Are we thinking about reforms within the justice system? So if a young person gets involved, either on the juvenile side or on the adult side, that we actually are, are we actually believe in a sense of reformation and reentry. And so it's, it's really thinking holistically about all these various elements where part of the challenge that we saw, and frankly, we saw this really with COVID as well, it was how thin that line was about how singular shocks are, can be challenges to some people, can be impediments to some people, and can be absolutely existential to others. Well, how, do we, how do we level that playing field? Well, I, it's, it's such a great point. In, and on COVID, um, it has revealed that these challenges are matters of life and death um, in the short term, you know, not just in the medium and long term. Um, but the challenge with COVID has been getting people to think about things beyond the immediate testing and maybe tracing to some of these underlying uh, issues. And we, we've talked about this in some other episodes of the podcast. How do you view the, the challenge similarly when there are victims of police violence, um, getting that discussion expanded. And I'm, I'm really talking at the political level. You know, how do you get people to see it? Not, not just the fact that it's bigger than policing um, and bigger than COVID. How, how do you get people to pay attention and, and work towards those solutions? You know, one thing I always believe, and I, and I think about both with our work over at Robin Hood or the work that I've, you know, done in this space uh, throughout much of my adult life and service, it's, it's, uh, it's data matters in terms of helping people to understand that where I come from and, and, and where, I, where I fall and stuff, these, these are not emotive splurges. Uh, these are not quote breaks, mm-hmm. just facts. And so if you're looking at, if you don't so take a look at just some COVID stats, right? The fact that is, is if you had breakfast with your family today, you're better off than 2 million of your neighbors who are at risk of going hungry, right? It, it, that, at the height of the pandemic in New York City alone, one in three parents of small children were skipping or reducing meals to feed their children. One in three parents. This is not, these are not emotive. This is data. When we're talking about the fact that, you know, again, take a look at you know, the catchment or some of the work we do with Robinhood in New York alone, half a million New Yorkers lack internet access at the onset of the pandemic, making it absolutely impossible to learn from and to, to learn or to work from home. So we see how the way these impacts, how the way these things impact people differently. And oftentimes, and it's impossible to deny the fact that it happens during on racial lines in addition to economic lines. And it's impossible to separate those two dynamics. And so the way I think about it when it comes to even navigating it in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of political conversations and and frankly, as you know, all this stuff gets much more complicated, not just when it delves into political conversations, but also, you know, how to keep it from delving into political conversations. The reality is, is that when you're thinking about, when I think about the population that I will always fight for, defend, and serve, which is oftentimes the most vulnerable, the ones who find themselves in the most complicated situations, and the majority of the time, for, to no fault of their own, how can then we introduce data? and introduce statistics and also wrap it up in a powerful narrative because I do think there's a narrative change component to this that has to be important to let people know why we have to prioritize what we prioritize and what are the things that we're looking for to make sure that we're actually moving a benchmark that has to get moved. So force people to look at the facts. They have to, they have to. And I, and I think that it comes back to this idea that statistics can add context, but, but, but narratives, uh, but narratives actually promote action, but you have to be able to have the facts as your baseline. You have to be able to know that we are moving and we are moving in the direction that we're moving in because the data is screaming at us and it's, ref- and it's, and it's refusing to let us look away. Um, I want to ask you a 
last but difficult question, which is we live in a time when sometimes people make up their own facts. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the facts that they make up are about people who are disadvantaged and the struggles that they face and whether or not some of these challenges that we've spoken about are real. And you could even look at some of the recent um, dialogue at the political level um, and wonder whether there's really a commitment to solving problems like this at all, or whether these problems are being mined for political benefit in a way. I mean, I, I'll, I'll say that, uh, but, but um, how, and maybe you were alluding to this a little bit when you said steering away from some of the politics, but, but h- how do you think the future of these discussions is going to go in a country that is so polarized, including around questions of um, uh, urban poverty? I think the thing we have to remember is when we're thinking about the, 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 the unifying thread of our society and all this, the unifying thread is, is it is our basic humanity. And you're absolutely right where it's not even just that people will introduce new facts or different facts. They'll introduce lies. They'll introduce lies that, that work solely towards their benefit even if it means hiding or masking what real facts actually are. Um, You know, I remember having a conversation with my publisher, though, where I'm a very, very data-driven thinker. Uh, I like data. I like statistics. But I remember having a conversation with him, and he said to me, he's like, you know, we're talking about The Other West Moore, my first book. And and I said, I think I want to do a 10-step prescriptive guide. Here are the 10 steps that every parent should do. Here are the 10 steps that every mentor should do. And he said to me, he said, listen, Wes, I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh, and this was before I had children, but he said, no one wants to read a parenting book by a 30-year-old with no kids. <laughs> I said, that's actually a pretty good point. <laughs> and he said, tell us the stories. And he said, people will understand the point that you're trying to make without feeling like you're beating them over the head. It needs to be based in reality, based in stats, but people will better understand what you're trying to do when they feel like you're not trying to beat them over the head with something. And You know, and I realize it is this thing where I can tell a person a stat that can be real and accurate and well-researched. They can come up with something that could be completely either a falsehood or another stat that just took different inputs that's going to completely contradict what I pulled together. But the thing that is important for people to walk away from in all this is what is the humanity of the decisions that we are making? Why are we making them? How are we going to personalize it? And how can we make sure that when these decisions are being made, that people can see themselves, see their family members, see their friends, see their kids in this? Because it will help people to come to a better understanding of not just the why, but get into an urgency of the what. And so you're giving people facts so that they can understand the broader situation, but you're appealing in a sense through through stories and through um, uh, individuals um, to their humanity. So they're oriented to those facts in a way that promotes action. That's exactly right. And I think the stats, the stats are also important for the leaders because we need to be driven by data. We need to make decisions based on what the data continues to show us. We can't run away from it. We can't hide from it. The decisions that we make have got to be data-driven decisions. Then the key question becomes, now, how do we go out and sell it? How do we get it passed? And how do we make sure that it's sustainable and lasting? Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. This is a fantastic conversation. It's my joy. Thank you so much, Josh. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.